Chapter 14 The Importance of Mindfulness Guarding the chitta most of the time or the whole time is the way to promote mindfulness and the chitta so as to make it competent in the work of samadhi pavana and in other kinds of work also. For then, whatever type of work is done is done deliberately with mindfulness to keep one's attention on that work and it will tend to be elegant and free from fault. As to oneself, one will not be a playboy wasting one's life in dissipation, but a person or bhikkhu who keeps within his level or status and does not act in ways that diminish his status and the standard of his work so that it becomes despicable. Therefore the saying that mindfulness is desirable in all circumstances is correct and most appropriate and cannot be disputed. The necessity of mindfulness will come to be seen when one practices Samadhi Pawana or one investigates Tamma in all its different aspects. In work of this kind, it is essential that mindfulness should go along with it at every moment in order that one may be able to know what is happening to the Chitta and Tamma with enough precision for one's purpose. This becomes increasingly important for those whose ground of Chitta and ground of Tamma are above the normal level. And right up to the highest levels, mindfulness is still an essential tamma every time and it cannot be dispensed with. In fact, whatever acuteness, strength, and capability of wisdom one has, it depends on mindfulness to support it and promote it. So even if wisdom is about to reach the ground of great wisdom, Mahapanya, it gives an indication to mindfulness that it also must reach the ground of great mindfulness, Mahasati, because mindfulness is that device of tamma which leads the way in all kinds of work. Ordinary people like ourselves who are at times unmindful display characteristics at those times which are unseemly and inelegant. And in those cases where they let go of mindfulness in a big way, as if they have lost all interest, it seems that the time has come for them to be taken off to an institution for certain. It is for the above reasons that those who practice the way and attain tamma do so either slowly or quickly, depending upon the strength of their mindfulness and wisdom, which are very important. And this is true even allowing for differences in character. Therefore, those who urgently drive themselves to develop mindfulness will soon find that samadhi appears and their thoughts and insights in the direction of wisdom will come much more quickly than otherwise. It makes me think about the task of writing a book such as this one, for it becomes quite clear how, on a day when mindfulness slips and drifts about due to a lot of confused thoughts, one's writing is full of mistakes, confusion, and many corrections. But on a day when the heart is not confused and one has mindfulness present, one's writing is mostly correct and good with little need for any corrections. Those who are well known and renowned for their abilities in the Chitta and Tamma are generally those who have mindfulness and who are able to see the importance of it. So they try to establish mindfulness the whole time without letting their minds slip into forgetfulness. In particular, when they do Samadhi Pawana, as well as the investigation of all forms of Tamma, their mindfulness and wisdom must blend into one another all the time, and they do not allow them to be present sometimes and absent at others. Whoever acts and lives like that will have Dagara Tamma, the Tamma which wakes and arouses him to be vigilant, within himself wherever he goes and in whatever he does. He has a means of protecting himself which is strong and lasting, so it is difficult for an enemy to reach him, and there is no danger to his heart. This is entirely different from those who are not mindful and who accumulate dukkha, and however much they have, they go on accepting it to the end. Venerable Ajahn Man taught the need for mindfulness very frequently and most insistently, regardless of the type of practice being used, the posture, or whether it concerned someone who was just beginning or one who had done it for a long time. In all cases, he was certain to teach the need for mindfulness, along with other things, to suit the level of chitta and tamma of the person who came to learn from him. He said how he had seen the bad effect of being without mindfulness, as well as the virtue of having mindfulness present from when one first starts to put forward the effort to do the practice, right through until one has reached the final goal. 
He also said how both of these were very important factors which one cannot afford to neglect, and to give confidence to those who practice the way, he said, Regardless of age or sex, if those who do the practice have interest in and pay attention to mindfulness all the time in all postures and situations, and not in fits and starts, they should have the hope and expectation that the attainment of samadhi, samadhi samabhati, as well as the path, fruition, and nibbana will not be beyond their reach. From the time when one first starts the training, one should set up mindfulness as one's constant companion and guardian. Then one's sense of oneself, of the right and wrong, and the good and evil, which arise in oneself and others, whatever it may be, one will be able to know for sure, and this will steadily increase while one remains mindful. At the same time, one will not let go into absent mindfulness, which would allow the kilesas to drag out and steal the good that is in one and swallow the lot. If one can do this, one should have firm hope and expectation indeed. Yet generally speaking, those who practice the way of tamma turn and become those who blame tamma, saying, it hasn't given the results which it should, or it gives me no results when I do the practice, because those kilesas which lead them into absent mindfulness sneak in to take over the duty of mindfulness by getting in before mindfulness, which should be the leader, and then stealthily take over the job of looking after the chitta. This happens both when one is trying to strive at the practice and at all other times as well. This makes these people feel disappointed that they did not achieve what they thought they would. But instead of blaming themselves for losing out to the kilesas, they turn and blame Tamma for giving them bad results. So they lose in all ways. This is the way of those bhikkhus who practice without taking any interest in watching the kilesas which lead them into absent mindfulness. And this is the main danger, both to oneself and to one's efforts to do the practice. This great boss, the kilesas, thus gets the opportunity to remain with the one who does the practice quite openly, without him ever becoming aware that he has been taken for a ride. If one is an observant person, one will be able to know what has happened within a minute. For when one first starts to establish the practice, in any of the various ways of doing it, by setting up mindfulness in conjunction with the effort to do it, that is the time when one will be able to see how the setting up of mindfulness and the dispersing of mindfulness will fight each other, so that one can look at it and see what happens. Then before long, the forgetfulness which disperses mindfulness, which is nothing but the kilesas intently watching and waiting, will win and drag the chitta away and disappear with it. From that moment, all that is left is the body of one who practices without mindfulness and void of effort. If he is walking chankama, all that is left is the mere activity of walking. If sitting in samadhi, then he is merely sitting. And if he is standing to ponder tamma, he is merely standing, just like a puppet or a doll. It is no good searching in him for the kind of effort which is put forth by those who practice the way truly, because mindfulness, which is that factor in striving to practice which gives rise to results, has been entirely consumed by the kilesas of carelessness. All that is left is the body which is merely going through the motions of striving, and nothing else. This is how the kilesas destroy people and destroy the efforts of those who practice the way. Their destructiveness takes place right in front of one's eyes when one is fresh and conscious, by lulling one into a deep sleep of forgetfulness even while one is actually striving to practice the way. At any time, it is quite possible to know how clever the various kilesas are if one really wants to. Even when one is just beginning to work at the practice, one can get to know this without much difficulty, but generally speaking, one does not want to know. Instead, all one wants to know are the attainments of samadhi, samadhi samapaddi, and the path fruition and nibbana. But what can give rise to these states of tamma apart from mindfulness and wisdom, which are the necessary tools for clearing the way? Certainly not careless indifference, so that one has no interest in being guarded against it, for this is what destroys all forms of tamma such as the above, which one wants and hopes to attain. Sometimes, when Venerable Ajahnman gave a talk on tamma, what he said was very funny, and we who were listening could not help laughing inwardly. 
I can remember how funny it was, but the tumma that he was pointing out to us has almost gone now. He said, If your heart was truly in your efforts to practice the way, like someone who is full of vitality and spirit, your heart would have a way in which it could develop and grow. Not like people getting into their coffins all the time as you are now. For whenever I look nowadays, all I see is scrap bhikkhus and scrap samaneras like scrap metal, moving about and walking back and forth on the Chunkama path, sluggish and ungainly, without any mindfulness or awareness within them. As for any wisdom, banya, or penetrating insight, if they are sitting in meditation, they merely sit there, like scrap iron men thrown away in a shop or a factory. But even scrap iron does not sway about, nodding forward and backwards like a person dying in the pose of striving at the practice, which is most annoying to see. As for the Kamatana Bhikkhu who sits nodding out of control, whether he falls down and dies or not is enough to trouble others who have to recite the Kusala This is a sorry thing to see, and sometimes at night when the crows and dogs are all asleep, if anything happens, who will come and help to arrange things so that the corpse is given a traditional human funeral? If this happens in daytime, the vultures and crows will be troubled also, for when they come flying around thinking that some food is available, they see that it is still breathing and fidgeting, and they are afraid to come too close, so they fly away and perch on a tree to wait and watch. Sometimes they think, this is it, and they fly down to have a look at the troublesome object again, feeling sure that they will be able to have a go at it this time. But as soon as they get close, its mindfulness returns, and it looks straight at them. So they are all afraid and fly away without much hope left. But once they have flown about the place to try and find something else to eat, they come back again. Because the appearance of this one who is trying to meditate is like someone who is half dead, as if telling the crows and vultures to come back again, saying, It's dead now, you can come and eat it. This is how it acts all the time. It's enough to make them irritated with this waste bhikkhu who keeps changing his position. This is the way of one who practices and causes irritation to the vultures, crows, and dogs, both domestic and wild. He not only causes irritation to them, but he will break the heart of the one who teaches him, which is far worse than the trouble caused to the animals who are waiting to eat the meat and bones of this bhikkhu when he dies, because he has no mindfulness to support and lift him up at all. This is a kind of practice which is an endless preparation, never stopping and never giving any results. At this point, Venerable Ajahn stopped and rested for a short while, and it seemed as if he was looking to see what was the state of mind of the bhikkhus and samaneras who were listening. What he saw was that they were all sitting quietly and undisturbed, some afraid and some amused. Then he started speaking again, as if he was answering some of their unanswered questions, saying, How would it be to arrange a funeral service, a Gusala Madiga, for a bhikkhu who is still alive? They have the merit-making ceremony, Gusala Pangzukula, for those who are dead. If they don't have the merit-making ceremony to make merit for those bhikkhus who sit in meditation and sleep as if dead even when they are still alive, won't they all fall into hell? Even when they walk Jangama or sit in meditation, they sway back and forth as if they are about to jump down into hell while they are still alive. When the time comes for them to truly pass away, where are they going to jump to if not to the hellish abyss of perpetual sleep? We who were listening had never heard of the hellish abyss of perpetual sleep previously, but Venerable Ajahn revealed it to us at this time. After the meeting... Various groups would quietly gather together to talk for a short while, before breaking up and returning, each one to his own place where he worked at his meditation practice, which Venerable Ajahn had called a mortuary of half-dead bhikkhus preparing themselves for their funeral service. But, as I related earlier on in this book, it was strange how none of the bhikkhus or samaneras displayed any signs of irritation, of being upset, or of discontent with what Venerable Ajahn had said in his castigating talk. For each of them heard this unusual and rather amusing talk on Tamma with inward satisfaction and pleasure, hoping that he would not finish too soon. 
This was probably because of their complete faith in Venerable Ajahn, that he was in a state of complete purity, and that the ground of his citta was overflowing with metta. And for that reason, none of them ever felt inclined to criticize him in any way. In fact, instead of being repelled by the rather morbid tone of his talk, it aroused their mindfulness to reflect and see how baneful and harmful it was to be forgetful and without mindfulness internally within each one of them. While giving a talk of this kind, Venerable Ajahn's appearance and tone of voice were quite intimidating, but once he had finished he immediately returned to normal, as if he had never been like that at all. Those bhikkhus who had stayed with him for a long time, so that they had learnt to know his characteristics quite well, would talk normally with him after such a tamma talk, as if nothing unusual had happened just a short while ago. But those who had recently come and had just begun the training, never having been exposed to such methods of tamma as Venerable Ajahn used to correct and straighten their characteristics, would react in various ways when suddenly coming up against it in this way. Some would fidget and move about, others would become conscious of aches and pains, or of getting hot or cold, without having enough mindfulness to be able to restrain themselves and be self-controlled. Like what happened when a dog was picked up and thrown onto the body of a dead tiger. It got so frightened, all it could do was to make grunting sounds, jump away, and run for its life. What was unexpected was that it left part of itself spread all over the body of that tiger. But what was it that it left behind spread all over the tiger which had so frightened it? As for the dog, it had fled without restraint. Generally, those bhikkhus who went to receive training under Venerable Ajahn were, to begin with, rather like that dog, thrown onto the dead tiger. They did not have enough mindfulness to control themselves as they should, and standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, they were always afraid that he would only criticize and scold them. But they did not think of the underlying reasons why he should do this, which are far more frightening than that dead tiger was to that dog. Footnote. To say that dogs are frightened of tigers is an understatement. In fact, they are terrified of them. If they meet a tiger, whatever shit they have in their bowels, it all pours out. But generally, when a dog meets a tiger, it becomes petrified and cannot run away. It just stands there stiff and shits. Even when one picks up a dog and throws it onto a dead tiger, as related above, the same thing happens and this is because of a deep-rooted instinct in canines which have always had this fear. Those people who live in and about the forests where tigers roam are bound to know how dogs react to tigers. But those of you who have lived in the cities or in Bangkok all your lives may not know about this, or you may not believe it. But in fact, this is true and correct. Note. This footnote is part of the original Thai text. But those who had been under training with Venerable Acharya for a long time, the more he scolded them, the more it became like a remedy which quickly cured their sickness. And no sick person is going to get angry and resentful with the doctor, who quickly gives him some medicine to help him overcome that sickness which is bearing down on him so that he cannot save himself. Instead, he is likely to be grateful and thankful towards the doctor who can find a way to save his life, which he, the doctor, does because he has the metta to give help to others. Those who practice the way and see the danger of being stupid, which is due to their own kilesas bearing down on them and piling up against them, will be happy and smile with contentment at such strong yet kindly teaching. This teaching, which is given with the aim of curbing and curing their own kilesas, and it comes from an Acharya whose citta is full of metta and thoughts of helping others in all sorts of ways to get free from, to avoid, and evade the gilesas, and a mass of suffering, and not to give way, lie down submerged and defeated, completely subject to the power of the gilesas which always bear down and force one towards destruction and ruin. Listening to Tamma Talks from the Teacher When one listened to the Tamma teaching of Venerable Ajahn, if one listened for the sake of Tamma and truth, 
opening one's heart to its deep knowledge and true reasoning, without holding oneself back to let the gilesas of conceited opinions, dirtemana, obstruct and influence the tamma which he revealed, then one would hear tamma that went to one's heart. This tamma could cure the gilesas one after another, like going straight up steps, in a manner which one realized quite clearly in one's heart while listening to him each time he gave a talk to us. In particular, if something happened to surprise or stir him, such as a chance event, or something connected with one of the bhikkhus, he would seize this as an opportunity to set it up as an example to reveal tamma then and there. At such times what he said was much more valuable to the listener than those more normal occasions when he gave a talk. Those who tended to be afraid of Venerable Ajahn would become so full of fear as to be almost out of their wits. But those who were more intent on reason, truth, and tamma got this in full measure depending on their own ability and mindfulness and wisdom. The tamma which came from Venerable Ajahn at such a time was not like anything that they had previously heard, but it was absolutely appropriate to that occasion without repeating the pattern of anything he had said in the past. Because it was a characteristic of Venerable Ajahn Mun's way when revealing Tamma that he would not normally repeat lines of talk which he had already used in the past. Even those old sayings and proverbs which he may have used before, when he brought them up again, he would interpret them anew without repeating his former explanation. Although his meaning may be close to what he had previously said, it still acted as a skillful method which we who were listening to him could use and we could not help but admire his skill time and again. It showed that the research which he had done within himself was in accordance with what is called true Patisampita Nanusasata. Those who had stayed with him for some time grew more and more to like that tamma of Venerable Ajahn's which was forceful, strong, impressive, and rousing, much more than they liked his normal, milder approach, because its flavor was so unusually impressive. But those who had never before heard such tamma would think that he was scolding them, and they would become frightened to the point where they would forget to pay attention to the truth of his reasoning at that time. So what they got out of listening to his tamma was entirely different, almost as if there had been two separate tamma talks, although in fact both groups heard it at the same time. When Venerable Ajahn taught Tamma to those bhikkhus who practiced the way and were close to him, he would teach in a manner that went directly to the truth of causes and their effects, without mincing his words or wrapping them up nicely. He would range through all the levels of samadhi, all the grounds of wisdom, and all three of the Thilakkarna. Whatever things he was dealing with, he would bring them to life, clear the way, and reveal them as they are for those who were listening in a manner which went right to the heart. This was most appropriate to those bhikkhus whose hearts were skillful in every stage of citta pavana. But the one who is writing cannot reveal everything that he said, for this tamma was just between Venerable Ajahn and the one who was receiving it. All that can be said is that it was tamma of the type that is very hot and spicy, which frightened the Kilesas and drove them away in large numbers because of the power of this austere tamma, tapa tamma, which scorched them and drove them out and away from his remarkable or miraculous teaching, anusasaniya bhartiharya, like water being dried up by the sun. It was as if one could see all the clans, families, and relatives of all the different types of Kilesas being broken up and forced to disperse in disarray without retaining any semblance of order at that time. It is said that when the Lord Buddha reached the end of a Tamma talk, some or many of his faithful followers penetrated the exalted path and fruition Tamma from the lowest level of the Arya Tamma up to the highest level. In this present age, although the type of Tamma talk of the kind which reveals the elements of the world, Lokatatu, which Venerable Ajahn Mun taught to the circle of bhikkhus who are practicing the way, may be only an insignificant shadow in comparison with what the Buddha taught, yet when the writer compares them together to assess the truth of the above assertion, he cannot help but have complete faith that what is said to have happened after the Tamma talks of the Lord Buddha is completely true. Those who say he is gullible and believes too easily may say so, but those who believe will continue to believe what we have written. 
for the Kilesas are a true and genuine factor in the noble truths Arya Satya, and the Tamma which cures and overcomes these Kilesas is also a true factor in the Arya Satya. When the second truth reaches the first truth in full force, the Chitta is bound to experience a manifest result every time and everywhere that it happens, in everybody without exception. The Lord Buddha taught the truth of Tamma, and Venerable Ajahn Man also taught the truth of Tamma, for the purpose of curing the Kilesas which truly exist and have always done so in every age and time in the same way as they do now. Therefore, Whoever may give such a teaching, the loss and dispersal of the kilesas, which occurs due to the tamma teaching, which washes and cleanses them out, is valid as far as reason is concerned. One should not object to this, because both the kilesas and the path, magga, do not depend on anything except only on the acquisition and accumulation of the kilesas and the curing of the kilesas. That's all. It's like a thing or a place which is filthy, the cleansing of it depends only on its being washed with clean water. While listening to Venerable Ajahn Mun giving a Tamma talk, those in particular whose chittas had reached the ground of wisdom should have been in a fit state to be able to analyze and see the implications of what he said while following the lead given by Venerable Ajahn. This means seeing clearly while wisdom is destroying the kilesas by relying upon Venerable Ajahn's Tamma to prepare the ground. Those who were listening and analyzing following Venerable Ajahn's lead would therefore at the same time be curing the kilesas bit by bit accordingly. By listening, analyzing, and curing some of one's problems this time, and then listening to another Tamma talk in the future, doing further analysis and making further inroads into the kilesas, and by going on in this way many times, they must surely be able to get through the thick jungle of the kilesas and go free. Therefore, those who do not want to let others believe that listening to a tamma talk can lead to the penetration of the path and fruition, would seem to be making an exhibition of those kilesas which they have been fond of displaying in the past. For normally, the kilesas do not like reason, but rather they like making a display of self and flattering their owners that they are clever, even though they are not clever, and even though those who truly are clever and wise and far more senior keep on blaming them and remonstrating with them all the time. The hearts of those who were attaining in the basis of samadhi, a state of calm, would, as soon as they heard Venerable Ajahn's Tamma, drop into a state of calm much more easily than when they were doing the practice on their own, because his Tamma would pacify and soothe them while they were listening. So listening to Tamma is a practice that is an important branch in the whole field of striving to practice the way. As for those who have never done any practice and never listened enough for any results to become apparent, if they want to go their own way and follow their own understanding, they are free to do so. But in truth and in accordance with what is valuable and useful, this is not the way to gain anything of any use at all. All that is likely to come from it is defilements which stain the name of Buddhism, causing disheartenment to those who have set themselves to practice the way and making them fed up with this sort of thing, so that they laugh inwardly while saying to themselves, this clever genius thinks he'll become enlightened by his opinions and opposition to the true way. For they brush aside and dispense with the path, fruition, and nibbana, saying, We should leave it alone as being only within the power of other people in other ages and places. But for themselves, they just swallow the emotional attitudes of opposition and opinionatedness, which becomes the ground of their hearts. When an Acharya, one who practices the way, asks his followers, just after he has given them a Tamma talk, saying, While listening to this talk, did you get any sense of it or not? He is asking them whether they got a sense of calm and peace, or whether they got any insight in the way of wisdom, respectively, depending on the ground of their Chitta and Tamma, which is different in each one of those who are listening to his Tamma talk. He is not asking whether they took note of and remembered the meaning of the Tamma which he revealed, although some of it might have dropped into their memories, which they could then easily recall. But it is not at all necessary to be able to remember or recall whatever has slipped away, 
for the important thing is to set one's chitta to attend with present awareness right there while listening, and not forgetfully slipping away to other seductive and emotionally charged topics, but having mindfulness to accompany the chitta with the duty of maintaining inward self-knowing. The flow of tamma which the Venerable Acharya is revealing will then enter and make contact with this knowing which has already been properly established and one will hear clearly and listen to every word, far more so than sending the citta outwards to receive tamma. The citta and the flow of tamma make contact and acknowledge each other, not in fits and starts, but steadily and continually, lulling and soothing the citta causing it to become calm and unwavering, and to drop into samadhi. Then, while listening, other emotionally charged sense stimuli do not intrude and cause trouble, nor does the chitta go out and become involved with external things which arouse interest, which agitate the heart, making it dull and inert. So there is just the chitta and tamma in contact with each other, and the chitta will tend to become calm by itself. Once it has become calm, there will be no more enticing thoughts and imaginings to cause disturbance, and one tends automatically to forget one's tiredness, aches and stiffness, as well as the passing of time. In fact, it seems at this time almost as if one did not have a body, for all that remains is the resulting peace and calm, letting the chitta drink of the best nutritive essence rather than the other thoughts and sensations to which it is attached. Aramana while the chitta and tamma are intimately associated together as one entity, there will be no weariness, irritation, or boredom for however long it may last. For as long as the chitta does not withdraw from this state of calm, the body will not be troubled with any painful feelings, nor will the chitta be bothered by emotionally biased objects and situations, aramana. The heart and tamma will then be together with each other, dwelling in a state of calm and peace, for they have never been antagonistic to each other since the beginning of time. But as soon as any other emotionally biased object or state arises and becomes manifest, it arouses antagonism. Then the body feels weary, the heart becomes irritable, sleepiness grows strong, and one's flesh, sinews, and bones in various parts of the body start to give rise to aches and pains which rapidly spread everywhere, as if its parts are going one after another into a state of decay. Because those gilesas which are the basis of laziness tend to go around the various parts of the body, disturbing them and inducing them all to ache and pain and give trouble. Finally, the effort to practice breaks up and becomes incoherent, diffuse, and half-hearted in an incompetent way, because this is in fact just what it is. This is the story of the gilesas, and all kinds of them work in the same way. They all lead people and other beings to harm and destruction, whatever type they may be. So they are called Mara, the evil one. If there are few of them, they may cause trouble and damage in a small way. But if they are many, they cause much trouble and much destruction. They are in opposition to Tamma, which is the one that helps, supports, and promotes us in all ways that are good. The more Tamma a person has, the more it will tend to make his heart calm and peaceful, and he can go on gaining more and more Tamma until his heart is entirely Tamma. Then he will have changed entirely and become Tamma throughout. Such are the ones who are entirely possessed of Tamma and possessed of supreme and eternal happiness. When Venerable Ajahn Mun used to ask whether we had got the meaning of a talk on Tamma that he had just given, the above explanation is what he meant. Starting from a state of calm and happiness while still listening, right up to a state of brightness and clarity and wisdom that can enable one to get rid of some of the gilesas each time, depending on one's ground or level. This is what he meant by getting the meaning while listening to a tamma talk. It may happen many times until one can finally reach the end of the kilesas and know all tamma at that moment, and this is what he called getting the whole meaning. Generally speaking, the Tutanga Kamatana Bhikkhus listen to Tamma and get the meaning. They set up the intention to get the meaning where the heart and Tamma come together, and the result of this is a state of calm and clear seeing which arises in the heart. As for remembering the gist of the Tamma which was revealed in the talk, 
they do not consider this to be so important as keeping their attention firmly fixed where tamma and the heart come together. Because of this, however many of them are sitting and listening to the tamma talk, they are so still it seems almost as if nobody is there. For each of them has fixed his attention to listen in his own heart, and each one is just like a tree stump, motionless, without any sign of fidgeting to show that he is tired or bored and has had enough. The only sound is that of Venerable Ajahn, who is delivering a concentrated form of tamma which puts one in mind of a heavy thunderstorm with hailstones and high winds blowing and gusting about this way and that. At this time, it also seems as if all the kilesas and evil gamma would be blown away and destroyed by the blast flowing from the tamma. Because while listening with fixed and firm attention to the meaning, not one of the Gilesas is going to show its face and open its mouth to display its conceit and arrogance, while mindfulness and wisdom are cutting them down and chopping them to pieces with all their strength, all that remains is Tamma, which externally is the sound of Tamma, and internally is the heart immersed and infused together with Tamma as one, with nothing but joy and happiness accompanying the calm and peaceful Tamma which is experienced arising in the heart. Each time the Tamma talk would last three or four hours, after which, if any of us had any problems that were appropriate, we could respectfully ask the Venerable Ajahn to help and point out the solution to the problem until it was well understood. After this we would disperse, each one returning to the place where he was staying. Some would then go to walk on their chunkama paths, to ease the stiffness from sitting a long time, and to remove the kilesas from their hearts, using whatever method in which their mindfulness and wisdom is strong and capable of practicing. They would probably go on walking for several hours before stopping and going to have a rest. But on those days where there is a tamma talk, the time when they leave off to take a rest is much later than usual, because they consider that they are special days and special occasions. So some of them decide to maintain their striving only in the three postures of standing, walking, and sitting until dawn, without lying down and sleeping. There are two reasons why they do not lie down and sleep at night. The first is because they want to struggle and make great efforts in their striving as a way of paying homage to the tamma which Venerable Ajahn revealed with great metta in the most heartfelt way right through from beginning to end. For after listening, faith would arise and increase, giving them the will to struggle, to try to do, and to follow what he taught with such metta. The second reason why they take no sleep is because they have absorbed the tamma of Venerable Ajahn very deeply, and the flavor of tamma which remains in their hearts is what has opened up their hearts. The extent to which each of them absorbed tamma in their hearts varied in accordance with the ground or basis which each of them have in their hearts. Some of them have a weak basis of samadhi, some have a more subtle basis, and some have a very subtle and intimate ground of samadhi. But each level brings enough of the bliss, the piety of tamma, to enable them to absorb it joyfully in accordance with the level of each one's ground. In addition, some of them would begin to train themselves in wisdom, vipassana banya, in a weak way as accords with their level of samadhi. Some would be analyzing with wisdom, which are vipassana, more strongly. Some would be developing wisdom higher and higher and some would be developing wisdom at that level where it has become automatic. This is when mindfulness and wisdom incessantly go around and about everywhere with various kinds of tammas that come into contact with the heart without letting up or letting go of them. If one likens it to falling rain, it would be like a heavy downpour going on all day and night incessantly. Or if one likens it to water, it would be like a spring which flows all the time in both the rainy season and the dry season. But in the case of Vipassana Tamma, it is referred to by its characteristics and called by the forest name of automatic mindfulness and wisdom. But if one wants to call it by its original name, which they used at the time of the Lord Buddha, then it was called Mahasati in Mahapanya, so it should not be lacking in valuable properties, for mindfulness and wisdom at this level perform their functions at maximum capacity the whole time without stopping, hesitation, or being sluggish, nor do they need any coercion or force, unlike the more usual types of mindfulness and wisdom. 
where they know their job and they know their duty in full measure. But to call it Mahasati and Mahapanya, as they did at the time of the Lord Buddha, would be against the nature of those bhikkhus who live in the forest, who are afraid of making out that they are the equal of those at the time of the Lord. So instead they just call it automatic mindfulness and wisdom, which would seem to be quite appropriate to their level and characteristics. These are the tammas which lead the Dhutanga bhikkhus to become fascinated and absorbed in their striving, so that they lay down and sleep very little. Each one of them becomes absorbed in tamma in his own way, depending on his ground or level, and when any doubts or problems arise, some of them are not bold enough to go and ask Venerable Ajahn about them at normal times. But on a day when a meeting is called, they feel as if they could jump over the moon, because they are so glad to hear a talk which will clear the way and show them how to develop those points which they have been thinking about and analyzing, and will also clear those problems which they were doubtful about, so that they can go ahead step by step. Each of them gets prepared and sets up a state of zeal waiting ready to receive the cleansing tamma from Venerable Ajahn Mun as if they had been waiting years for it. So when the time comes, they gather at the meeting place in a calm, modest, and graceful manner, which should arouse much respect and faith in anyone who saw it, a thing such as is rarely seen elsewhere. Each one of them goes to the meeting intent on the purpose of tamma, and with a determination to hear tamma which goes to the heart, and each of them pays obeisance by prostrating before sitting down politely while waiting to hear tamma. As soon as he is ready, the Atsariya who is giving the talk begins to reveal tamma. Quietly and gently it flows out, steadily, without breaks, like rain when it starts to fall drop by drop. But before he begins to talk, he calms down any turbulence of mind that may be present for a short while. I think and believe that he was probably determining what aspect of tamma he should deal with, which would be suited to those who were waiting ready to listen to him. It was after this that he would begin to reveal that tamma which he taught only to the two danga bhikkhus. Generally speaking, he would start from the level of samadhi and then go on to wisdom, finally leading to the highest level of tamma, Vimutti, freedom, and then finish. While he was revealing Tamma, there were no disturbing sounds at all, but only the sound of Tamma that he was proclaiming, which resonated around the place where they had met together. Those who were listening were doing so with interest, waiting to know and wanting to see accordingly, in conformity with Venerable Ajahn's teaching, fully committed and wholeheartedly, not slipping away into forgetfulness and distraction so that the chitta ran away elsewhere, but keeping their attention fixed firmly, looking at the heart alone, which is worthy of tamma at all levels. In this way, the tamma which the outsider reveals and the heart which is set, ready to accept it properly, are both suitable and appropriate for experiencing all sorts of things to enter, make contact, and get involved with the heart. Whether he talks of the noble truths, the satipatthana, or the telakana, anitsa, dukkha, anatta, they are equally the truth and embrace the whole field of human beings and all other beings throughout the whole universe, the lokathatu, which he reveals at that time. So it is like listening to the truth of the universe flowing in and filling the heart, which having been prepared to accept and know it in a fully committed way, makes them listen wholeheartedly. Because the tamma which goes back and forth, making contact with things both near and far, internally and externally, while Venerable Atsarya brought them up and displayed them, is the tamma which helps in all ways, in everything, down in the body and the chitta of those who can listen to it, and there is no way left for doubts to arise. After listening to the talk which Venerable Ajahn gave with great metta, and hearing about that which is good and virtuous, as well as that which is bad and faulty, the heart of the listener which has in the past gathered, accumulated, and guarded all the kilesas, thinking of them as being fundamentally good things right from the first beginning, should be willing to let go of them and get rid of them. Otherwise it means that his heart must have been much too blind, dull, and closed. But who would deliberately set themselves to accumulate and shower more dukkha on themselves at such a time? Especially after they had determined to listen to the truth with full-hearted willingness from their Acharya who reveals tamma that is wholly true. 
Rather, they would just be listening to his teaching which was true tamma, so as to see clearly what was faulty and what virtuous in themselves, following his talk. Then those things which were wrong and faulty should be willingly let go of, whereas those that were virtuous should be held to and developed in accordance with the truth and their intention. This is the only way for them. Therefore, those who listen for the sake of truth of tamma, which the Atarya is displaying in a true and valid way, have a means of knowing and of getting rid of, and this is the result that comes, and this result is their confirmation and guarantee. Diseases which are cured by medicines, and gilesas which are got rid of by tamma, are both instances of natural processes which are used in the world and in tamma respectively. The exceptions are, of course, the disease which does not listen to the medicine, and the type of kilesis which will not look at tamma. Wherever such a situation exists and arises, it is bound to lead to ruin inescapably. So such people are said to be beyond hope.